So thanks, comrades, for the, um, thanks, comrades, for the welcome. Um, can I just uh, make one point, not by way of resolution, which is maybe the left we could do with a bit more diary coordination <laughs> because we've got a conference around the corner uh, with the Labour Party on public ownership, alternative models of economy, uh, alternative models of ownership, um, which is packed out, talking about how we can bring rail water energy back into public ownership, how we can double the cooperative sector, how we can look at alternative models of corporate governance as well, which has inc been incredibly successful. And actually, <laughs> actually, it's almost like the translation of the LRC's resolutions from 10 years ago into the Labour Party policy. So congratulations on all the campaigning that you've done over that time. Um, apolog apologies, as I say, from here on in, we'll, be we'll get better coordination of our diaries in future. Um, let me just um, say this very, very briefly, and I'm, I can see I've, I've come into the room just a, as a, when there's an item which is the least contentious you'll be debating today. <laughs> I just want to tell you where we're at, and I'll give you my, I've read the LRC statement, and I just want to give a couple of ideas about where I think the LRC should, should be going at the moment. Um, in terms of since the general election, we've now sought to consolidate the position within the party in terms of where we're going on our overall program and our overall objectives. And that's meant we're doing an exercise at the moment to recognize that the manifesto that was in 2017 was a manifesto for that election, for that election. We have to take that manifesto and recognise, yes, it will be the foundations for the debate that we now have in the run-up to the next election, whenever that comes. And we have to use it as the basis for radicalising many of the ideas that were in that manifesto. And I pay tribute to Mike on the launch of the book this week um, that took a lot of those ideas from the manifesto, then took, looked at how they could be radicalised. The reason that we need to do that quickly is because the general election could come at any time. I think the Tories will cling on to office for as long as possible, but it will be clinging on to office, not clinging on to power, because I don't think they can exert power in the, the way in which they're divided in the cabinet, divided in the, the parliamentary party in the, under the Tories, but also the fact that the DUP have a veto on any government policy that comes forward as well. But I think they will cling on. So we've got to be ready for both the short haul and the long haul for whenever that general election comes. So what we're doing at the moment is taking every policy commitment in that manifesto, turning it into an implementation manual about how that could be implemented, but then ex and also drafting legislation so it's on the shelf for whenever that election comes, but also going outwards now, much further outwards, in saying that was the commitment in that manifesto, that was the policy, how do we radicalise it and how do we go further with it in terms of really testing it to how it can be implemented and how radical and how effective it can be? That's a, uh, that's a huge and mammoth task when you think that manifesto was genuinely transformative. It crossed all policy areas, it crossed virtually every walk of life within our society itself. So it's a huge task and that task can only be undertaken by the mass movement that we now have. So some of the work that we're now doing is, is, again, trying to get the party to turn outwards again. That's why we're doing this conference today about alternative models of ownership. And again, it's a packed conference where people are coming along from different sectors and different part, parts of the party to actually talk about the detailed implementation, for example, about how we bring water back into public ownership. What should be the management structures? What is the role of the workers? What is the role of the consumers? How do we do it financially? What is the... What is the way in which we'll swap the bonds for shares and go forward on all that? What is the investment strategy? We're drilling down into that scale of detail. And that's important because this election literally could be at any time. And I, I keep saying it, to be frank, if our election campaign had had another two weeks, we could be in government now, I think. I think we were that close in terms of building, building well, pardon the expression, momentum into the campaign itself. <laughs> that's where we're at. Um, in terms of what's happening within the party, within the Parliamentary Labour Party, they're signed up to this exercise. They're signed up to this exercise. We're now involving 
virtually all the PLP in that discussion and debate and how we go forward. The front bench, the new, the shadow cabinet, the, uh, working extremely effectively and coherently working together. Parliamentary, me members of the parliamentary, they part, if they're not on the front bench and on the back benches, we're trying to make sure they're fully involved in those discussions. And yes, if there are criticisms, and if there, are, if there is a critique developed, bringing them in to see how we can address those criticisms. We may not always agree, but at least we'll have an understanding about what those disagreements are and how, how we can best resolve them. So, in terms of mobilisation within Parliament, there are some issues where there will be principled discussions and, and, yes, principled disagreements, and you have to respect that. But again, I keep explaining to people, don't mistake democracy for dissent. That isn't what we're about now. But in terms of the mass movement of the party itself, Again, in the discussions that are taking place in all the conferences and, and the meetings all around the country that we're doing, we're still attracting large numbers. In fact, we're still recruiting more and more and more people now are becoming much more involved in, in the discussions. And what's interesting, the wisdom of cr the crowds is building within our movement as well. People coming along with their own expertise to demonstrate how these individual policies can be more effectively implemented. So I'm confident, excited about the period we're going into. I just wish the election was sooner rather than later, but we'll see. We'll see how, how it goes forward in, in these coming months. With regard to the, uh, with regard to the LRC, my, my view now, you know, when we set it up, we set it up at a, at a time when basically we thought at that point in time we'd have to bring together rank and file members of the party, along with campaigning organisations spreading beyond the Labour Party and along with the trade unions. And it was done on Tony Benn's advice, basically, that we had to establish, and that's why we called it the LRC. It was like re-establishing the Labour Party within the Labour Party that, at times, we couldn't recognise ourselves as the Labour Party under New Labour. And what happened, and what happened was, is that the LRC built on that basis of bringing people together. I have to say, if you'd have asked me all those years ago, uh, would Jeremy Corbyn be the um, leader of the Labour Party and me and Shadow Chancellor, of course I would have said yes. <laughs> because it's the old Gramsci, isn't it? Pessimism of the will, uh, you know. <laughs> Optimism of the will, anyway. At that point in time, we thought it would be a much longer haul before we got into positions where we could mobilise a mass movement, build a mass movement, and then go into government. Well, we're here now. We're on the edge of that now. So I think, let me just throw this in, I think the LRC's role now is to do two things around maybe tactically deciding the individual issues, but the LRC should do two things around those issues that we decide are the priorities. One is, first of all, I think the LRC, we always wanted it to be a think tank. We always wanted it to be a place where people could develop ideas into policies for implementation based upon, again, the collective wisdom of our organisation and the expertise that we have. I think the LRC can pl still play that role. And as Mike has done in the publication of that, that, the book that he edited this week, that demonstrated the range of expertise that we can call upon to, as I say, take the policies that we have now, bring forward new ideas, and then radicalise what we've got. So I think there's a specific role for the LRC in doing that, particularly when we're faced with battering after battering at the moment of right-wing Tory-funded think tanks hitting us over policy. I, I, was on, I was having a pleasant chat with Nick Robinson on the Today programme this morning and he was quoting, he was quoting the Social Market Foundation. They don't, when they get us on, it's always left-wing that, left-wing that and all this and all the rest of it. They don't bring the Social Market Foundation say, on, say the most Thatcherite right, right-wing organisation that's ever been seen in the history of politics in this country. They don't introduce it in that way. We will. Um, <laughs> and they didn't say either that the report that they'd just done on the water industry, well, actually, Nick Robinson did at the Half Seven interview, was funded by the water companies themselves, so it was, clearly was unbiased and lacking in any form of self-interest. But those, those think tanks are out there, well-funded, on the right, by commercial organisations in particular. We have limited resources in terms of funding, but we have m massive resources in terms of intellectual weight. And I think the LRC has a role in looking at the areas it wants to concentrate on as a think tank to bring ideas forward. Secondly, those ideas will not get implemented without a Labour government, of course, but to get to a Labour government, we have to convince people 
about those ideas in practice. And that means running campaigns around those individual policy priorities to expose what's going on at the moment and then to proffer the alternative. Now, I just take the water industry as an example. The water industry has been possibly one of the most, the, one of the most gigantic rip-offs under the privatisation policy programme that Tories have brought forward. £18 billion paid out to shareholders over the last 10 years, 40% increase in prices and costs over and above inflation, and also, if you remember, when the water industry was privatised, all debts were wiped out. So when they were privatised, these companies took over debt-free. They've now racked up huge debts, and at the same time, at the same time, paying out dividends even in years when profits have not been made. So dividends have been higher than the actual profits made. Now, when you explain that to people, because this information doesn't get out there through the normal national media, the mainstream media, when you explain that to people, people are horrified at what's going on. They understand they're getting a poor service, high bills, and they're seeing rip-offs like this, and often those profits going into tax havens where no tax is, is paid as well. And people are getting angry about it. So there's now, in terms of water, in the opinion polls, 80% support for bringing it back into public ownership. But that support will dissipate unless we expose what's going on and then put forward our ideas in detail. Now, I think LRC can choose a few topics like that in which we work as a think tank to expose what's going on and put the alternative forward, but also we campaign, we campaign to publicly get that information out. And I give the example of this. 20-odd years ago, um, I was involved in bringing together the tax justice campaign in, in, in Parliament, and we used to have meetings there. Some of you were there. They, they weren't, you know, as well as I. There was half a dozen of us at best. Not many people interested, but we were, with Prem Seeker and John Christensen and others, doing the work, the research, <clears throat> bringing analysis forward of what was going on, tax evasion, tax avoidance, how we could tackle it, what the policies were. We were getting no coverage whatsoever, and then a group of young people come along called UK Uncut, they run a direct action campaign to expose what's happening. They're turning up at the companies that are ripping us off as well to expose what's going on. A peaceful direct action campaign in which they literally turned an issue that no one was talking about into a, actually for a period of time top of the agenda in lots of the media as well because the media could not ignore what was a growing campaign. I think that's the style of campaigning for the future which is about First of all, acting as a think tank to develop the ideas, expose what's going on, put the alternative, and then mobilizing, mobilizing then campaigns to develop support for those ideas and get the message across. I think that's the role of the LRC, and I think it's a unique role that the LRC can play because we can pull in with other alliances, with trade unions and other campaigning groups to do it. If you look at an example of what's happened, Kat Hobbs was at our conference this morning. She was the one who we worked with through the trade unions on the fares campaign of our rail. And again, what we saw there was passengers taking action in support of the campaign that they had down there to bring rail back into public ownership down in Bristol. I think that's the role that the LRC could play in the future. You'll all have different ideas, but that's my two penneth worth in, in this debate. We took a decision not to fold the LRC up into momentum because we thought there could be a distinct role for the LRC, particularly because it's an open and democratic organization in which people can feel comfortable in participating. I think that was a right decision, but now we have to say what is the specific actions in this coming period that we need. And I, I'll be frank with you, from a from the leadership of the Labour Party perspective, what we need is the ideas and campaigning support to win people's hearts to those ideas in this coming period before we go into government. And then, of course, when we go into government, mobilisation to support that Labour government as it rolls out the policies. And I say it time and time again at the various meetings I'm doing, the most important thing is to recognise that when we go into government next time, it cannot be, and we cannot tolerate it being, just a group of MPs, some hierarchical group going into Parliament, then going to number 10 and number 11, finally ministerial positions, cut off from the movement itself. When, it, when we go into government next time, we've, got, we've all got to go into government. Yes! And that, what means, that, means, that means being integrally involved in the development of policy and then the implementation of that policy. And to be frank, on the range of policies that we're developing now as a result of the ideas that were developed initially within the LRC, there's so much work to be done. 
on all those particular areas. The good thing about it is the enthusiasm is maintained, the levels of excitement within the movement are building rather than dissipating, the levels of support, and we've seen the opinion polls, we're on about 40%, something like that, the levels of support have been maintained since the general election, despite a media campaign that has been as hostile in the last few months as it was initially before the general election as well. Despite all that, we're maintaining the levels of support, we're winning local authority by-elections, and at the same time, we're working with particular groups to build the registration, particularly within the what is described as the precariat, to build the registration, to build political participation on a scale we've most probably not seen before. So I'm optimistic, but I'm also daunted by the scale of the challenge that we've got and the scale of the work that we've got to do. But I tell you, if you all turn up at Conway Hall for, an, for a special general meeting of the LRC on a wet, cold day like this, you build confidence in me about the commitment that we have within this movement. Solidarity. <laughs>
It's a basis in law in which we will have free trade unions once again. But if you look at it, you know, when, what John and Keith and Kat have done is that they're saying we're not asking for the earth. We're simply asking for future governments to abide by the law, i.e. the International Labour Organization conventions largely. And so it's, in some ways, it's a very systematic piece of work that's readily translatable into, into um, practice in office. We've asked Keith to go away and he's coming back with the detail of how you set up the departments, etc., and how you bring that legislation forward. Keith is a specialist in delegated legislation, um, which we're now campaigning against over the Brexit bill, but we might use on this one. Um, but in addition to that, we've asked John and Kat as well to come back with advice and assistance, particularly, and this is one area that we've really got to crack, which is around bogus self-employment in particular, and the more work that needs to be done. And there's some disagreements uh, with the IWW and some of the work that the IER are doing, so we brought them together to try and ham hammer that out. Interestingly enough, um, we've now set up a working group as well, which John Hendy and others are there, with the Federation of Small Businesses, because they want reform in the law in terms of self-employment as well, where we have genuine self-employment rather than bogus self-employment. In terms of, look, on the deficit and borrowing, let's be clear, we introduced Labour's fiscal credibility rule, which basically said this, that we will not borrow for day-to-day -day spending, we don't need to, because we'll have a fair taxation system, we will borrow to invest, and over time we will bring down the debt-to-GDP ratio, and it'll be on a rolling programme, we'll eliminate the deficit over time. Now, Again, well, the reason we brought that forward is because we wanted to highlight the fact that we were in government. What we are doing, to be frank, is ensuring that we're investing for the long term. That will, I think, grow the economy in a way in which we can then ensure that we have a prosperous economy, but where that prosperity is shared by all. And again, this, none of this is rocket science. It's mm. absolutely basic. And in fact, it's what's happening right the way across Europe in terms of the way that they're going in the move towards the rejection of neoliberalism overall. And of course, we're working with our socialist and social democratic parties across Europe in that joint uh, campaign, if you like. In, what we've got to do now, and this is again some of the LRC work in the past that, that we've done, we've got to expose the Tories on, on their economic arguments. The fact that they can get up, having borrowed nearly 800 million in, since they've been in office, whilst the austerity measures are still going through, whilst they've cut investment on infrastructure, research and development and skills training, and then get us, get up and accuse Labour of somehow being profligate, is bizarre. So we've got to confront that on every possible occasion we can. Getting through the mainstream media is difficult, but actually those door-to-door -door conversations that we're having in canvassing and at school gates, in our workplaces, that's where we've got to get the message across. I don't think we've clear enough on our narrative on that yet, so that's what we're working on the, at the moment. So I'm doing these economic conferences around the country. We'll be doing our annual State of the Economy conference um, at the beginning of June, and that'll be advertised soon, and that again will help comrades shape the narrative as we go into the next battle in terms of these arguments. The final bit with regard to climate change now. Look, we've been emphasising time and time again on, on every policy area, particularly linked to the economy now, that everything we do, everything we do has got to be assessed in terms of climate change. So I did a speech last um, autumn in which I described the, our, the role of the Office of Budget Responsibility. And we said we will task the Office of Budget Responsibility with ensuring that they look at the costs of climate change and the cost of climate change of each of the policies that brought forward. George Monbiot contacted me. He's been a supporter over the Third Runway campaign and all the rest that he threw over the years. He was, so he's an, in some ways, he's an ally in a lot of these issues. And he described this as a, one of the most significant breakthroughs in government that we could have. And I think it's true. Because the point is right. We could be in a situation now, and we've got to get a sense of urgency about this. We're talking about at the end of a species here, if we're not careful. We're already wiping out, we're already wiped out several other species in this recent period, we could be wiping out our own species until we get to grips with this one. And you'll see it as an increasing theme around all that we do in, in this coming period. It'll certainly be a theme of what we do in terms of economic policy making. Again, what's interesting is it's excited people. In the last election, where, are, where did our votes come from? 
We maintained about 80% of the votes of that vote Labour from 2015. The Tories maintained about the same as theirs. The UKIP vote split about 20%, 25% to us, 75% to the Tories. But we took Liberal votes on a scale not seen before, but also, and I don't say this with any sort of hostility or anything like this, we also took the Green vote in most constituencies because for the first time in a long period, we were emphasising the threat of climate change and the concrete policies associated with our programme and actually that are inherent and have always been inherent in the democratic socialism that we've sought to develop way back over the last century and that will be a key part of our campaigning plank in the future. Can I just say thanks, comrades? I'm sorry about this clash and all the rest. I've got to get back there, otherwise they're worried why the Shadow Chancellor's convened a conference and he's not here. Oh, I know. <laughs> it's a, uh, I'll get... I, I, I don't want the compliance unit expelling me just for not turning up at a conference, OK? Solidarity, comrades. Thank you.